Hello, this is Christine Jenkins with Spectrum Women Magazine. Today I have as a special guest Dr. Will Mandy, a clinical psychologist from University College London in London, England, who's just published a new paper on camouflaging in women with autism. Welcome, Dr. Mandy. Thank you very much. We're very interested in the diagnosis of women, especially mm. older teens and into adulthood. Mm. Are you working on a tool that will uh, correctly diagnose these women as being autistic? <clears throat> yeah, um, so you know, we know that our current tools aren't good enough for identifying um, girls and in particular women with autism. Um, and so we are trying to develop measures that pick up uh, some of the behaviours that we particularly see in autistic women, and in particular um, camouflaging, um, uh, so that that could help with diagnosis. I still think that if you think that most autism diagnosis is, is based on a small number of kind of standardised instruments, I think it's like the ADOS <coughs> or the ADIR, and we know in particular the ADOS just misses a lot of women. So I think that's got to be the next focus of attention, is designing the sorts of assessments that are used all over the world, that are used as standard practice, but we need to tweak them so that they don't um, do what they currently do, which is to underestimate autistic symptoms uh, in, in autistic girls and women. You talked about the gender split mm. and that it's coming down and it used to be four to one. Um, where are we right now as far as self-reporting women and yes. uh, reliable ways of deciding that? It seems that, from our research, it seems if you do, if you follow the kind of current conventions on how to do an autism assessment, you'll get a gender ratio of about three to one. Yeah. If you go out into the community and you try and identify anybody in that community who has autism, you'll tend to find three autistic males for every autistic female. What we suspect is that that might represent a slight underestimate of the true number autistic females, because we happen to know that if you don't use diagno sort of a diagnostic assessment, but if you look at females who have really high levels of autistic traits, you tend to find higher numbers of females amongst them, and, and a male to female ratio of about two to one. So I, I think what that tells us is that there's still a bit of work to be done in terms of, A, making our assessments more sensitive to females with autism, but B, making sure that, that the women and girls who need assessments are actually getting through the doors of the clinics. You talked about the gatekeepers being mm. the clinicians and professionals yeah. needing educating. Yes. I think that we did a study on um, what we called late diagnosed autistic women. So people who hadn't received their diagnosis until they were 15 or, um, and older. Most of them, in fact, have been diagnosed in their 20s. Or 48 like me. Yeah, quite. <laughs> yeah. And what they all reported was having difficulties from a, a much earlier age in their diagnosis. And what's more, people like teachers, family doctors, were aware of those difficulties. They just didn't interpret them as being autistic. autistic. So on the one hand, that's a shame, because you know, they didn't get the support and the diagnosis they needed at an earlier age. But on the other hand, it, it does imply an opportunity, because you know, these girls and women are kind of being noticed. So if we could just educate the teachers, the family doctors, and so on, to be a bit more aware of how autism presents in, in girls, um, we could dramatically improve uh, the kind of recognition and, and, and make it earlier and more accurate uh, in females. One of the women in your clinic mm -hmm. said that, um, actually, that she would have been diagnosed sooner but for her good ability at camouflaging. Yes. How do you see behind the mask then if that's taking place. Yeah, so we've talked about camouflaging and, and, and what, what we're talking about here is, is this sort of tendency or this, uh, in some people feel it as an obligation, to perform kind of behaviours uh, and uh, sort of ways of relating that mask or hide autistic symptoms. Now there's a couple of ways that people have tried to, to get at this. What, the approach we've taken is that we've done some studies where we've asked autistic women and men in depth about camouflaging. You know, questions like, what is it? What would you like to call it? What does it involve? What are the consequences? Why do you camouflage? So that we've, and then we listen very carefully to what they say and we analyse what they say using uh, qualitative research techniques where we systematically kind of take their words and work out whether there are particular themes in the data that, that, that are common to lots of different people in the study. And from doing that, we've 
we're beginning to build up a fairly good picture of camouflaging, kind of what it is, the sorts of behaviours it involves, when people do it, why people do it. And then we've used that to design a self-report questionnaire on camouflaging. So we're trying to have a, a, a sort of instrument or a questionnaire measure that gets, that allows people to report their own camouflaging experiences and will allow us to identify who's doing more camouflaging, who's doing less. And um, women tend to do more. That's what we're finding, yeah, yeah. that women report higher uh, sort of levels of camouflaging and more of a sense that they have to camouflage. For than social to do the males. expectation. Yeah. Uh, to be fair, I've met plenty of males who camouflage, but on average, it, I, I think women are, are doing it more than males. And are they willing to admit that? Is it something that it, if mm. you're dependent on self-presentation for yes. these surveys. Yes. Are you going to have women coming forward or are they going to lose their job or a partnership yeah. perhaps if they yeah. do get I mean, intervention? My experience is that whenever I raise the topic with um, autistic people, say in a clinical assessment or in a research interview, people are normally quite grateful for the chance to talk about it because they kind of say, you know, I'm doing this all the time and, they're and nobody knows and it's exhausting and it's really nice that somebody's kind of acknowledged that. Um, and, and I think that raises another point, which is you know, camouflaging clearly can get in the way of a clinical assessment because if somebody turns up in an office and they kind of camouflage really well and the psychologist or the psychiatrist is assessing them, they could miss that, that they're autistic. But what I've found is that in clinical work, if you just have open conversations with people, you know, do you do this? Do, do you camouflage? Or do you ever feel like you have to pretend to make eye contact even though you don't want to? People are normally very able to reflect on it mm -hmm. and to talk about it. And, mm -hmm. and I think that could be a good lesson. do it too. I mean, they have this imposter syndrome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and they might say, well, what's the difference with just... You know, you have to put on a certain hat when you're yeah. in a certain group of people. Yeah. What's different about a, a woman with autism doing that? Yeah, that's a very interesting question because obviously everybody manages their image the whole time. You know, we all have thoughts <laughs> that we don't speak out in, in, in me at meetings and, you know, we behave one way at a funeral and another way at a party. And, you know, we're constantly um, controlling our kind of the way we try and present. And we're self-censoring. Yeah, self-censoring and kind of playing by a set of social rules, I suppose you might say. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's an interesting the question. For is me as an autistic woman, is that's an intellectual exercise, figuring out the yeah. rules. It's not an innate, yeah. so uh, instinctive to, yeah. Yeah. act. So you're constantly going, okay, the rule just changed. It's like on the playground. You know? yeah. We want to control the game yeah. because then we can set the rules. But if, if that's taken out of your hands, mm -hmm. You can mm. have a sense of frustration or yeah. uh, panic, even yeah. anxiety, because the, the game has changed. Yeah. And I've met quite a few autistic women who have a particularly focused and spe specialist interest yes. in fundamentally in human psychology. Yeah. Um, for example, Social I remember talking to one, yeah, a one who was really obsessed with the novels of Jane Austen. And you might think on the surface you know, those are exquisitely psychological novels in which people's inner lives are very carefully sort of described. But of course, in a way, what a great way to, to learn about human psychology and, and, and what motivates people. And you know, there's that wonderful phrase in there from Oliver Sacks, where I think he described Temple Grandin as an, an anthropologist on Mars. Oh, no. Yeah. Social anthropologist. And that, and that conveys some of the kind of the intellectual element of it, that, you're, that you yeah. have to kind of intellectualise the rules, Everything. Just, like, like an mm -hmm. academic or like a researcher. Mm -hmm. You also talked about the fact you work mostly with under 18s yes. and that their traits got stronger in puberty with the crisis of puberty, hormones, other things. Have you seen any evidence that our autistic traits will continue to get stronger with age? Yeah, so we have some preliminary evidence that in girls but not boys, autistic traits go up over adolescence, uh, become more severe. Mm -hmm. and. What I suspect is happening is that those traits were always there, but actually it's the social environment that's becoming more and more complex during that time. So those difficulties just become more overt. So I do suspect, actually, because I think you know, it's all very well uh, transitioning to secondary school, but probably the hardest transition in life is out of university, or you know, it's basically into, 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 into adulthood, yes. where suddenly you can't just do what people ask of you, you have to create your own kind of thing, and, and, and it's, a, it's a very, everybody finds that transition very, very hard. Mm -hmm. Um, so I wonder if there might also be another kind of spike there, you know, where, where people who have subtle social difficulties, those start to become 
particularly difficult because the environment has become so challenging. Failure to launch. Right? Yeah, quite. A, a yeah. common and, issue, um, not just, of course, for autistic people. I believe it was Patricia Howland who did some of the early studies on yes. employment and life outcomes. Yes, yes. And she was the one that had the 15% yes. fully employed. Mm -hmm. And I believe Dr. Stoddard's research corroborates that, that there are some self-employed, yes. such as myself, and yeah. there are people in part-time employment. But as far as gainfully employed full-time, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. quite a low statistic. And I don't think that's mm -hmm. budged. I, I, have you got any well, sign that that's improving? Funnily enough, because the, the thing about those follow-up studies is mm -hmm. almost by definition they're always a bit out of date. Because <laughs> you're following up. So Pat Howland's studies, which is a it's landmark study, those people were diagnosed a while ago when people kind of thought where fundamentally they were only picking up really quite severe cases, cases. of autism. Because it was very depressing to read that Yeah, book. I, think, I think it is a very pessimistic picture because these days, of course, we know, you know, you, CDC implies that in some classrooms in America or schools, you've got one in 33 boys that are diagnosed autistic. So clearly you have so-called mild presentations being diagnosed. I suspect the outcomes will, will be going up because fundamentally less severely affected people are. So do you think there will be more funding from Autistica or t groups mm, like that mm. in longitudinal studies of women so we can look at yeah. their quality of life? I think so. I mean, I think Autistica particularly, uh, you know, which is an organization whose research agenda is very driven by the autism community. Um, so they, they run processes where they have kind of focus group like events where autistic people prioritize what they yeah. should spend their money on, which is why autistic are now particularly interested in mental health and autism. But they're also interested in adulthood because you know, it is a great neglected phase in autism research. You know, the people have so become so focused on early development mm -hmm. and childhood and adolescence and, and proportionally we know much less about how it and I, I think mm -hmm. that is going to be a growing area. And adults are involved on your research team. Yeah. Um, Robin yeah, well, collaborate, Stewart particularly collaborating with Robin Stewart, yeah. Do you see that as a, a, a paradigm shift happening because these people are now old enough to contribute yeah. and be a meaningful partner totally. and I think in the organizations too? We see yeah. a shift happening. Yeah, do you? Yeah, I mean, I think it reflects a growth in, in, a, in good practice. You know, and I think this, um, the metaphor that's very often used by autistic people is the lab rat. Um, people yeah. talk about feeling like a lab rat and, and can end up feeling quite used by research or that they end up being discussed in language that feels quite derogatory and, and sort of disabling to them. And, and I think we're beginning to wake up to that. And it, it, the only way to do that is really via dialogue because, you know, as researchers, you know, I'm sure I say things sometimes that would be quite offensive to this person because I don't, I don't realise. So it, it has to be in a conversation. I think Twitter's quite good for that as well, actually. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, and I mean, someone, I don't know if you know her, Liz Pelicano, in, in, she's a colleague of mine in, in London, who is very, very committed to like, co-production of research and participatory research, and she's been a real, in England, she's been a real leader in that field, mm -hmm. and in fact, it, she, she also works with Robin and, and lots of other autistic people, so it, it's growing, and I, and, I, and I think, hopefully, it will become more widespread and more sincere, you know, because anybody can kind of put on a grant application, oh, we're going to have a focus group and we're going to ask autistic people what they think. But I think it's actually the challenge is to do it in a really meaningful way. Mm -hmm. And getting back to us with the results. So yeah, many surveys, yeah, we take true. them mm. time after time and mm. we never hear back yeah. and see that we made a meaningful contribution. Yeah, yeah, totally. And that's, that's another thing that Robin's very into. So she, I think that's part she of She works that. in Liz Pelicano's unit, which is called Cray. Um, and that's her role, is, is to kind of translate findings and, and put them out there for, for the general public and, and for autistic people. I should say you did a good job today. You didn't use the word disorder. You yes, actually didn't cause too much told stress. us that it's a neurological condition. Yes, yeah, yeah. And in Britain, they're much more uh, apt to use ASC rather yes, than that's ASD. True. Simon Baron Cohen and his group are another, mm -hmm. another influential group who, who are driving that as well, okay. actually. Yeah. yeah. And I, I do think Steve Silverman's book, uh, Neurotrops, oh, has had a huge impact it on, was a on life every autism research writer. Yeah. yeah. I mean, really I was book. lending it to people. I know it was a big read, but I said, yeah. you know, pick it up somewhere that interests you, whether it's the history mm. with Kenner and Asperger. Yeah, yeah, that was interesting, um, wasn't it? The self advocacy later on in the book. Mm. Uh, it's fascinating. Mm. And it's, 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 I called it a medical thriller. 
I, yeah. that's how I sold it to people. Yeah. Was that it's real? You can't put it down. Yeah, he knows how to tell a story. It's, he really it? is yeah. a good storyteller. And a lot of people, um, I'm friends with John Elder Robeson, and you know, we found out things that we didn't realize. Yeah. Like I want to yeah. go to Germany and read some of this original stuff. Mm -hmm. and, um, I've read Asperger in German and in French, and it's just it's fascinating when you see the turns of phrase and what he was trying to convey. And, I mean, he, he met the mothers of these boys, yeah. and they were really odd, and right. he didn't make the link that there was a genetic yes. connection, and those women today probably would have been diagnosed on the spectrum. Yeah. There was one who just abandoned her family, and just right. went off by herself sort of reclusive. I see. And, I didn't uh, realize he'd written these kind of oh yeah, he, quite detailed he, accounts he did the, the well. human yeah. genome, you know, the pattern. Yeah, of the, yeah. The oh, I see he was doing kind of pedigrees almost yeah. of their families. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. and uh, also some of his collaborators, like Sister Victorine, I mean, she was amazing. She did music therapy long before we would have called mm. it that. And mm. uh, of course, uh, that whole lab was destroyed in the war, but, yes. you know, yeah. it's really sad, but I think the Allies, <laughs> so it's a stray bomb. Um, assuming your work continues, are, are you going to be able to recruit more women as we go along, assuming you can find these self-diagnosed yes. women? You were just talking about that at the end of I the mean, presentation. The funny thing is that some of the research we've done has been traditional mode of recruiting people through clinics and so on. And some of it has been recruiting people online. Okay. And what you find if you recruit online, in stark contrast to clinical samples, is you get more autistic women than men. So you normally get about 60% autistic women, 40% autistic men. So, you know, I think, okay, you know, the issue with the online service, service is, you know, you haven't confirmed a diagnosis, you haven't actually met them. That's a real limitation from a research point of view. But I think you are getting at this interesting population of women who aren't necessarily to be found in the clinics or through more, but, but who are autistic and, and have a lot to contribute um, to, you know, to our, us trying to understand better about, about autism in, 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 in girls. Mm -hmm. Well, in Canada, you need a psychiatrist so, to be covered. And if yes, you do absolutely. pay your own way, then you have to... You know, fork out thousands of dollars. Yeah, so it has to be a psychiatric a diagnosis. Yeah. yeah, so that's very hard to find mm. for a woman. Mm. So there's yeah. the cost and there's the access. Yeah.